Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, my name is uh, Sajad Zalzala, Chief Medical Officer and Co-Founder of uh, Asia SRX. Uh, today is our first um, Ask Me Anything with our uh, Chief Medical Advisor, Dr. Terry Grossman. Uh, Dr. Grossman is a, a giant in the longevity field. Um, you know, he's written books on longevity long before, probably long before even it was called longevity. Um, you know, one of his books actually uh, was 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 one of the reasons why I uh, became interested in longevity back uh you know, back several years ago. Uh, so we're very honored to have him as an advisor and uh, very uh, welcome to have him as um, as as a uh, guest on our uh, uh, Ask Me Anything episode today, our very first one. Um, so um, I guess let me let me uh, ask uh, Dr. Grossman to take a minute to introduce himself. And, uh, and then the first question specifically you can answer while he's doing that, uh, how did you get interested in longevity medicine? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Z. Um, <clears throat> I've been uh, a doctor for 43 years, and I began as a conventional medicine do medical doctor working in the mountains west of Denver, <clears throat> and I was a GP, general practitioner, and I did things like run an emergency room, setting broken bones. I was in a mountainous area, taking out fish hooks people who had fell off of horses, I set fractures, I um, delivered babies, and just generally got a wide variety of experience as a general doctor. And then after about 15 years of doing this, uh, I started to become interested in complementary medicine, other ways of treating disease, other than just simply the drugs, uh, surgery that I'd learned about in medical school. And after about a year of trying some of these natural remedies on patients, I found out that a lot of them worked as well, if not better, than the conventional drugs that I'd uh, been using for years before. So I ended up uh, moving from the mountains to Denver to open a complementary medicine clinic. And in the course of a few years, a new specialty in medicine was born called anti-aging medicine. Prior to about 1992, when a seminal paper was published by Daniel Rudman, no one actually thought that the aging process could be changed very much. We were all destined to have a certain amount of years. We would get old. Eventually, we would pass on. Well, with Daniel Rudman's study on growth hormone in 1992, they found that men who were over 65 years of age who took growth hormone seemed to be aging more slowly. So an organization sprung up around this concept that the aging process could be slowed down, stopped, and maybe even reversed. And that was called A4M, the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. And when I saw uh, a little notice about their first annual meeting back in, I think it was 1993, I went to Las Vegas and uh, was absolutely fascinated by this idea that we could you know, change the aging process. So I've devoted myself since then to anti-aging medicine exclusively. And in the year 2000, I published my first book, The Baby Boomer's Guide to Living Forever. Then I became friends with uh, Ray Kurzweil, who's a well-known inventor, entrepreneur, currently chief science officer for Google. Um, he's a man who invented a scanner, he invented the uh, any number of inventions, the translating telephone, speech recognition, the list of his accomplishments goes on and on. Uh, and we decided uh, to write a book together. It was called Fantastic Voyage, came out in 2004, got translated into a dozen languages, and people started to come to my office from various parts of the country and the world. And it really changed the nature of my practice. So I really became a longevity physician full-time at that point. And then Ray Kurzweil and I wrote another book in 2010. And here we are in 2023, and I continue to practice longevity medicine. Um, so that's kind of a history of my transformation. Now, the answer to your final question, how I got interested, originally, uh, I was about in my late 40s at the time. And I was that was still when I was in the mountains practicing regular medicine. And I found that I couldn't do things as easily as I could do when I was younger. Like I would go for a run uh, 
or take a hike in the mountains and things hurt <laughs> when they never hurt before. And I found that I couldn't do as much as I could do when I was younger. So this was clearly part of the aging process. I didn't like it all. I didn't like it at all. I wondered if there was something I could do. So that's what stimulated me to go to that meeting for anti-aging medicine. So it's really a personal issue. And I'm glad to report that I think it is now possible for us to significantly slow down, stop, and reverse aging. Great. Well, thanks, thanks for that background. I really appreciate it. Uh, and then kind of the next the next question, follow up on that. Uh, if there were three things you could do for longevity in your 50s, what would those be? What are kind of your top three longevity hacks? You know, that, that word hacks, like, you know, is, is, is a very popular term these days. Well, um, Jack LaLanne, you know, the famous weightlifter and stuff, he lived, I think, till 95 or so. Um, he famously said there are two um two two pillars to living longer and living healthy longer one is diet and one is exercise and he said take diet and exercise put them together and you have a kingdom so i think that really diet and exercise are two of the three things that are most important and about diet it's really not that complicated i think a few simple rules number one eat less um Intermittent fasting, like, you know, going at least 12 hours every day without putting any calories in your body. Ideally, uh, several days a week doing 14, 16, or 18 hours without any calories. And that's actually a lot easier than it seems uh, at first blush. You know, all you have to do is skip breakfast and not, not eat after supper. And then all of a sudden, you're close to 16 or 18 hours the next day. Um, so... Eating less, doing intermittent fasting, eating more from the plant world as opposed to the animal world. So more uh, plant-based foods, not necessarily becoming a vegan unless you want to, but um, more plants, particularly fresh vegetables, things along those lines, fresh fruits uh, are very helpful. And then with respect to exercise, you know, HIIT training, high intensity interval training, does not take a long time. You can complete a hit interval in 15 to 20 minutes and you get literally, if not all, maybe even more benefits than you do from going for a 45 minute walk or jog. So hit training compresses the amount of time you need to spend doing some weightlifting as well, some strength training and those two for exercise. So those cover the, the, two, the two main pillars of diet and exercise. And then I think a real problem for those of us living in the world today is stress and closely associated with its sleep. I think that almost everybody that I talk to, one of the first questions I ask is, what's your stress level like? And it's interesting that they almost all answer the same way. Normally, I'm not too stressed, but lately I've been under more stress than usual. You have the same, the, I'll ask them the same question six months later, and they'll answer it the same way. <laughs> Normally, I don't have a lot of stress, but now I'm under more stress than usual. So I think a lot of us are really under a lot of stress. The world's become a stressful fate, place. Uh, COVID has upset the apple cart. You know, so many things have changed. The world is changing at an extremely rapid rate. And I think this is stressful for people. <clears throat> and as a result, I think that we're not sleeping as well. So, and I think one leads to the other. Stress leads to bad sleep. You got things in your on your mind. You can't fall asleep. You're waking up worried about things. <clears throat> and also bad sleep leads to stress. You don't feel as well. So I think doing something to improve your stress levels, you know, whether that's meditation, uh, whether that's exercising more, whatever it is, getting a hobby, getting a pet, doing things to reduce your stress level is very important. Uh, and then, if you're not sleeping well, if sleep's an issue for you, luckily there are a lot of both nutrients and even some prescription drugs that are not sleeping pills that can be used to improve the quality of sleep. So I would say that diet, exercise, and stress slash sleep are the three things that people, not only in their 50s, but in virtually every age, should begin with as far as their longevity uh, path. Sure, sure. I mean, absolutely. I mean, we we you know we emphasize you know that, those those basic foundations, um, and you know what what we do at Asia SRX, you know, we're kind of assuming everybody is is uh, you know 
you know, uh, has got the, the foundations down um, and, and we're, we're providing uh, value to, uh, you know, on, on top of that kind of extra layers of protection. Um, now, you mentioned back in 1992, you, you, you'd read that article on human growth hormone. Um, since then, I guess, what what is the most impactful evidence you've seen in humans that gives you hope that aging can be slowed down or even reversed? Well, I think, you know, a few years after growth hormone was uh, being used, not just to help short children uh, to grow more, you know, quickly, so they didn't end up very, very short. That was its original FDA approved purpose. Uh, it was being taken by healthy people to avoid aging. They found out that maybe it wasn't the greatest thing in the world. It might promote, you know, not necessarily cause cancer, but if people had cancer, it might make it grow faster. So the anti-aging movement moved away from that <clears throat> and began to look at some safer alternatives. And three that come to mind immediately for me, number one, metformin. Metformin, uh, the uh, most popular diabetes drug in the world, has been found to mimic the effects of intermittent fasting or of calorie reduction. Calorie reduction, where the animals in the experiments were given 30 or 40% less than their normal amounts of calories, um, were found to live 30 to 40% longer than the normally fed animals. So humans, some humans decided to try to do that, but it's extremely difficult to reduce your calories to that extent. The way that calorie restriction works is it activates an enzyme called AMPK, adenosine monophosphate kinase. Well, metformin also operates by activating AMPK. And they've done some studies where they've looked at aging genes and also genes that promote anti-aging, youthful genes. And intermittent fasting or calorie reduction will upregulate say 200, 250 of those genes, metformin will upregulate 300 or 350. So it's even more. So I think that the best of all possible worlds is to combine the two, take the metformin and engage in some form of calorie reduction, whether it's time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting or however you want to do it. I think both of those things are extremely valuable. Another uh, anti-aging strategy that uh, I like a lot is the use of hormone replacement, bioidentical hormones. And in particular, one that has anti-aging benefits per se, it makes people feel younger, uh, stronger, and better is testosterone. Testosterone is now widely available in multiple formats. It's available as pellets. It can be just implanted under the skin. They last for several months. It can be taken as a cream or injections. And I think that has a lot of anti-aging benefits, and it's not a particularly expensive thing. Metformin is not particularly expensive. It's available easily through HSRX. Testosterone would be something that you would need to see a local doctor about. And then something that I know Ageless has been doing uh, a study on is rapamycin. Rapamycin is uh, a medication that's been used for a number of years to prevent rejection of organs, like an organ transplant. Patient gets a kidney from another donor. They need to take something so their body won't reject it. So this anti-aging rejection drug would be something like rapamycin. Well, interestingly, unlike a rejection, anti-rejection use where it needs to be taken every day, maybe taking it every week or every two weeks, you can get some profound longevity benefits. And in every single animal species that's been tested in, Rapamycin has been found to extend the longevity of those animals significantly, 20, 30% or more. So those are three of uh, the new things that have occurred over the years that I think are available to people today. Yeah, um, so so to answer, to answer the kind of the question more directly, it sounds like the impactful evidence is kind of the proof in the pudding, so to speak, uh, where where you're, you're, you've deployed these uh, therapies to your patient population and you've actually seen um, the aging process slow down. You've seen patients uh, become healthier and, and 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 more youthful. Is that is that kind of what you're what you what what you would say? Absolutely. And in fact, with regards to metformin, it's been now used by so many people that it's gotten the attention of the National Institute of Health, and they're currently running a study called TAME T A M E the trial to assess metformin and aging. And I think it's got 
two or 3,000 people. It's a five-year study. It's funded to the tune of $77 million, and it will be unblinded in 2025. So in 2025, my strongest guess is we're going to find out how well metformin works in changing some of these aging parameters. But uh, there is increasing evidence. And if you look up, uh, like in Pep PubMed, National College for uh, Library of Medicine, there are any number of studies. I mean, I, it's literally in the hundreds of where metformin is being used uh, to prevent cancer, to slow down the aging process and things like that. Similarly, rapamycin is coming into its own and a number of studies are being published about that. There's a lot of studies about testosterone. The overwhelming majority of them show positive benefits. There've been a few that suggest perhaps it increases heart disease, but there are probably many more that suggest it prevents heart disease and having in fact a lower testosterone level is more harmful than taking testosterone. So we're putting all of this data that's coming out together and finding out more and more all the time. Nice. All right. All right. Um, and then uh, I can, that, that kind of gets me to, to the next question that was kind of submitted. And, and by the way, for those who are submitting questions by the chat, thank you very much. Um, well, you know, you know, some of them we may, we may already be answering. Um, uh, and so I may not go back for them, but, but I definitely, I see some that are, that are, that are, uh, I'll add to the list here. Um, but, uh, for, for another question that was kind of pre-submitted, uh, what are the best ways to measure a person's uh, longevity potential as well as their progress? Um, well, you know, that's a good question because just like, you know, you go to the doctor, they measure your blood pressure and your blood pressure is a little high. They're going to do something, whether it's, um, the dietary, weight loss, exercise, or blood pressure medicine, you know, you're going to come back in a, a few weeks or months, they're going to check your blood pressure again. So we need a yardstick. And with anti-aging medicine, we need the same kind of yardstick as a blood pressure cuff. Well, luckily, there's more and more ways of measuring the aging process. And I had mentioned previously that there are genes that are associated with youthfulness, and there are genes that are associated with aging. And we have the ability to find out which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. And that's a specialty of genomics that they refer to as epigenetics, which genes are on and which genes are off. And um, Steve Horvath has been a main researcher in this field of epigenetics and has uh, offered now to the public uh, some testing that can be done to see where you are on this aging scale. And by looking at the genes that are turned on and looking at the genes that are turned off, we can get an epigenetic age. So for instance, if a person is 48 and they're living a healthy lifestyle and doing things properly, they may find that their uh, biological age is several years younger than that. On the other hand, you know, for any of a number of reasons, including their genetics that they were born with, or possibly high levels of stress, or not getting enough exercise, or, you know, not following a healthful diet, or God forbid, smoking cigarettes, things like that, um, they might be older than their chronological age. So this is the yardstick now epigenetics that we're using by and large to determine how well a person is on the aging scale. Another one that's being used is the length of the telomeres. The telomeres are the little end caps on the end of the chromosomes to keep them from unraveling. And every time a cell divides, it, a little bit of telomere comes off. And unfortunately, in my experience, the laboratories that are doing measurements of telomere length don't provide results that are consistent enough, at least for me to have a lot of credibility in. I find that one year I test somebody and they're 10 years younger. Next year, they've done some good things and they're 10 years older. So it just seems as though the telomere length that thing is all over the board. But I'm hopeful that in the next few years, more and more companies will enter this field and will have accurate telomere testing. Okay, great. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Um, I think you kind of meant, uh, you already answered this one. What is the value of biological age testing? Um, we, we've we've already we covered that one. Thank you very much for that. Uh, how, how about this question here? Uh, how are geriatric therapeutics, aka longevity drugs, 
uh, different from conventional therapeutics uh, that are prescribed to treat disease. Uh, and, and maybe kind of to back up for those people who don't know the term gerotherapeutics, could you kind of briefly um, define what gerotherapeutics and then, and then talk about uh, how they're different th from con conventional uh, therapeutics? Well, yeah, the, the word gerotherapeutics or gerotherapeutic drugs, that root G-E-R-O, like geriatrics, mm -hmm. refers to aging. So gerotherapeutics are drugs that will modify the aging process. And I want to just make a distinction between aging and getting older. Everybody gets older. I mean, we're all, you know, 20, 30 minutes older than we were in the, when, when this little meeting started. But we haven't necessarily aged over the last 20 or 30 minutes. For instance, if we already exercised this morning and we didn't eat breakfast or we had a healthful breakfast, you know, maybe we turn back the biological clock a little bit. So that shows that it is possible to get older without aging. And that's what our goal is. That's what the goal of gerotherapeutics are, to help us to get older without aging. Now, what are the drugs that are gerotherapeutic drugs? As of today, there really aren't any pharmaceutical drugs that have as their FDA approved purpose, preventing aging or slowing down aging or stopping aging. So what we're doing instead is we're taking existing drugs and we're repurposing them. So among the drugs that I mentioned previously, namely metformin, it's an FDA approved drug for diabetes. We're repurposing, we're repurposing it to reduce the aging process, to slow it down and prevent cancer. Similarly, rapamycin, we're using it instead of its FDA approved purpose to avoid rejection of organs, to slow down the aging process and also prevent cancer and also improve immune function. And it has a long list of benefits as well as its um, memory uh, benefits as well. And then testosterone is the same thing. It's FDA approved purpose is to treat individuals have low, low levels of testosterone, what we call hypogonadism. But how about if you don't have a really low level, but it's low-ish, in other words, it's not optimal. The idea being maybe good is not good enough. You have a good level of testosterone, but how would you do, how would you age, and how would you feel if you had an optimal level? So that's the idea of kind of maybe a little bit of a difference between conventional medicine and anti-aging medicine. In conventional medicine, the idea would be, well, we're just gonna treat it if it's a disease. You have a low level, we're gonna give you a testosterone for that. But in anti-aging medicine, I think a lot of doctors are going to say, yeah, it's in the normal range, quote, normal range, but it's on the low, low, low side. And I can see from your symptoms, you're not really aging as well as you'd like. Why don't we give it a try? So what we're doing with Gero drugs, Gero protective drugs, is repurposing existing pharmaceuticals for anti-aging purposes. We're doing the same things with non-drugs, with some nutrients, for instance, uh, fish oil and coenzyme Q10 and NAD plus. So there are any number of other um, supplements that people can take that will help with the aging process as well. So I think, you know, we talked about diet and exercise and stress management, et cetera. We've not talked a little bit about some pharmaceutical drugs, but there also are some supplements that can be of value as well. Okay, great. Uh, so, so if I were kind of summarize, it sounds like Conventional therapeutics are, are targeted to, uh, to, to treating a disease, like you know, waiting until you have an A1C above 6.4, then you put somebody on a drug like metformin to, in the hope of like treating that disease. Where it sounds like a gerotherapeutic, you're, you're you're being more proactive with 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 it, where you're trying to prevent the disease and, and or diseases in general, like all the diseases, and slow down the aging process. Is that would that be accurate? Yeah, that's exactly right, Doctor Z. Perfect. Okay, perfect. All right, uh, and then a question from the audience here, just because it because it fits right here, uh, right? You know, pretty well with with uh, with uh, with what we just talked about. A growing body of research suggests that the process of aging accelerates in the early 30s, but it's steadily chugging chugging along much earlier than that. Um, for example, our skin is never as good as it, when, when it was when we were a baby. Uh, when do you think is a right time to safely engage uh, in gerotherapeutics to promote healthy aging? Uh, for example, um, you know, what are some questions a per person needs to ask themselves when considering starting a drug like metformin, like rapamycin, like some of the other ones? Well, 
That's a very good question. And I think we have some data that can actually give us an, a fairly precise and specific answer. And it's interesting that you said mid thirties because I think that's the point. And why do I think that's the point? A lot of the research into rapamycin in particular is centered on an enzyme found naturally in the body called mTOR. And the enzyme mTOR has been around for hundreds of millions of years. It's an ancient enzyme in the body. And it has an interesting effect because up until about 30 or 35 years of age, it helps people to grow, to mature, to get stronger, to get healthier. And then around 30 to 35, it like changes and it starts to destroy our health. It makes our lungs get smaller so we can't run as fast, our hearts get smaller, our vision is not as clear, our hearing isn't as good. You know, all of these things we associate with the aging process seem to begin for most people kind of in the mid thirties. So that I think is a reasonable age for people to start looking at, you know, gerotherapeutics. So if you're in your twenties, I think that non-drug therapies are appropriate because you got the mTOR working in your favor. You know, your hormones are typically high. Although honestly, I found both men and women in their twenties that have low hormone levels and are helped by you know, hormone replacement, bioidentical hormone replacement. But other than that, you know, just some supplements, diet and exercise will generally, and stress control, good sleep, et cetera, will take care of things until you get into your 30s. And then by mid-30s, maybe then it's time to start looking at things like metformin in particular, and maybe a little bit after that, rapamycin, et cetera. Yeah, now, I, I definitely agree that, you know, our, our stance at Asia Rx is, it, you know, the, uh, the age kind of depends on the therapy um, like, uh, you know, metformin is widely used, let's say for PCOS, which is a, you know, female fertility issue, you know, and, and, and so, you know, maybe, maybe it is appropriate for some, for some patients to start taking it when they're in their twenties or thirties, or but rapamycin, for example, um, you were mentioning, you know, uh, mTOR being important early on, but you don't, you don't want it as active when you get older. And so maybe waiting until you're in your forties or maybe your fifties to take it. So I think, uh, you know, I, that, that that's very much in line with with what uh, with what you know we've been hearing from other experts as well. So thanks thanks for taking the time to uh, to explain that. Um, another question here, um, going back to testosterone for a minute. Um, uh, I don't think you've, you've covered this one yet. Is testosterone supplementation only appropriate for uh, male sex individuals as a longevity treatment, or uh, is it uh, does it have value for um, for both? Well, that's a great question. Um, and I think the reason that we ask that question is because testosterone is only FDA approved for use in men. But then again, metformin is only FDA approved for use in diabetics. So we're repurposing these drugs for non-FDA approved purposes, which is completely legal, completely ethical. A doctor is able to prescribe a drug for a non-FDA approved purpose, as long as that patient understands it's not FDA approved and there's evidence that it's safe and effective. So in the case of testosterone, even though it's not FDA approved for use in women, honestly, it's fantastic for use in women. And when I prescribe testosterone to women, I think they like how they feel better than men feel with testosterone replacement. So I think that it's important for women to have their testosterone levels measured. And honestly, I see women in their 20s and 30s, very, very commonly with low testosterone levels, and they take some form of, of replacement therapy, and they feel better. They just generally feel better. They age more slowly. Testosterone helps prevent osteoporosis in both men and women, but because women are more predisposed to osteoporosis and bone loss, I think that testosterone is an important therapy for them. Um, so no, testosterone is not just for men, it's for both men and women. Great, all right, thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, let's see another question from the audience. Um, should, this is specific about rapamycin and metformin. Do you have, do you have patients taking both at the same time? Um, you know, what are the pros of that? What are the cons of that? 
you know, how have how have your patients, you know, for those, you know, if, if you've ever prescribed them together, how have patients responded to it? Uh, I do prescribe them together almost always. If I'm going to use one, I'm going to use the other. I think they work, you know, like uh, metformin works on AMPK and rapamycin works on mTOR. And both of those after the age of 35, in the case of mTOR, are harmful towards people as far as living longer and staying young longer. So therefore, we want to approach this from, you know, from different angles, not just, you know, when we go to war, and I regard aging as kind of the enemy, and I want to go to war with that enemy, I'm not just going to use, you know, the artillery, I'm going to bring in the tanks and the Navy and the Air Force. And so we're going to attack the aging process uh, with every tool that we have. So yeah, I think that it's a smart idea to take rapamycin and metformin together. And interestingly, I saw a study recently where rapamycin and metformin were used together to both prevent and treat pancreatic cancer, which is one of our most serious cancers. So using these, I think, uh, is both additive and synergistic. Got it. But you don't see any downside, like, for example, uh, too much uh, inhibition of mTOR, because it's thought that metformin might have a slight inhibition of mTOR. Have you, have you ever noticed any, anybody taking the combination and reporting uh, more side effects or, uh, uh, or, or any other potential issues that you, you've noticed? No, I really haven't. Um, I think that they get along with one another quite well. And, you know, as long as we're on the mTOR topic, there's two kinds of mTOR. There's probably more than two, but there are two main types. mTOR1, which is kind of our enemy after mid-30s, and mTOR2, which is our good friend throughout life. So we want to inhibit mTOR1 and leave mTOR2 largely alone. And interestingly, rapamycin does a pretty good job of that. It inhibits mTOR1, but largely leaves mTOR2 alone. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, we kind of touched on this a little bit when we, this next question we touched on a little bit when we talked about adding metformin to, let's say, intermittent fasting. Uh, but but this is kind of more broad. Uh, what is the unique uh, value of drugs such as metformin or rapamycin compared to lifestyle changes for promoting longevity? Um, in other words, um, you know, can't somebody just exercise and diet their way to longevity? Well, yeah. I mean, my grandfather, for instance, lived to be 105. He didn't take metformin. I mean, he died before we knew that metformin had any value in anti-aging. So yeah, it is possible for people to live, you know, past the age of 100 just with their lifestyle choices. I mean, he ate healthfully, he exercised regularly, he never smoked, things like that. Now, could he have lived to be 120 if he took metformin and did some other stuff? Well, unfortunately, that's not a question we can answer. Uh, my feeling is, yes, you can get a lot of longevity benefits from your lifestyle choices, but I think you can get additive benefits with using the both supplements and pharmaceuticals. But let's say, for instance, someone would prefer not to um, take pharmaceutical drugs, like they don't want to take metformin. Well, we have natural alternatives. For instance, there's one called berberine that also uh, upregulates AMPK. So that would be a good one to do as well. So we have natural alternatives, we have lifestyle alternatives, we have medications, and I think they can all work together with one another. Sure. Well, I, I don't want to delve too dark, too, go, go, go too far down the rabbit hole of berberine versus metformin. We get that qu question quite often, but kind of now that you brought it up, I mean, yes, uh, berberine does have some overlaps with metformin. Um, in fact, berberine does some things that metformin doesn't, for example, uh, reduce uh, ApoB and LDL levels because uh, it's thought to be a natural PCSK9. Uh, but uh, but not not as much is known about berberine in terms of its you know AMP kinase and some of the other benefits that you get from uh, from metformin. So I, I know I know early on when we were starting Age of Star X, a lot of people say, oh I can't I just take berberine. Well I I think I think there is some overlap between berberine and metformin. I don't think it's enough overlap. In fact, I take both. Uh, and 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 you know uh, you know for people who 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 it's uh, um, appropriate, you know I, I would also recommend taking both as well. So it's not an and you know it's not an either or. 
and 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 in, in this case, I think there's there's plenty of benefit to taking both. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, just just real quick, uh, somebody was asking if Asia Sarex intended to prescribe to offer uh, testosterone. Uh, as Dr. Uh, Grossman, I'll answer this one. <laughs> as Dr. Grossman alluded to earlier, testosterone is a controlled substance and uh, it's very tightly regulated by by various different uh, uh, regulatory bodies. Um, as much as we'd like to offer it, it's it's not practical, uh, especially with the uh, expiration of some of the uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, easements on, on control substances. Uh, so so we don't plan to offer any direct testosterone replacements, just not feasible. Uh, we're looking at other ways to optimize testosterone levels without directly. And 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 but that that uh, that's something we're 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 actively studying. So unfortunately, oh sorry. Um so not 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 anytime soon, not as long as testosterone remains a control substance. Um let me see. Let me see what the next question is. Um, all right, let's talk about trade-offs. Um, so there's almost two questions that are kind of, uh, that were posed, uh, and, and are very similar. Um, have you noticed any downsides from using metformin, um, as a geriatherapeutic, uh, um, agent? And then, uh, if so, do you think that all longevity therapies or geriatherapeutics have a trade-off of, of some sort? Um, and, uh, um, and are there potentially some that, if there are if there are trade off, are there some that have a big bigger trade off than others? Could you comment a little bit upon that? Sure. Um, I don't care what it is. A everything has got a downside. <laughs> I used to believe that there was nothing better to drink beyond water than green tea. I thought green tea is like a wonderful thing to drink. It's filled with all of these antioxidants. And then I found out that green tea is filled with some heavy metal toxins. So it's just the way that the leaves take it up. So the bottom line is there's no free ride in this world. Nothing's perfect. Metformin is not perfect either. So are the downsides to it? About hmm, 10 to 20% of people seem to be intolerant of it, largely due to gastrointestinal problems. That can be mitigated by beginning slowly, tapering up slowly, taking the extended release formulations. But even so, you know, maybe one in 10 to one in, uh, you know, one in five to one in 10 people just can't take it because of that, uh, the gastrointestinal. There also seems to be some uh, interference with the benefits of exercise if you um, take metformin. So I try to personally take metformin at bedtime so it's not going to interfere with uh, any of these exercise benefits that I'll get. Um, and that applies to everything. I mean, I don't care what it is, whether it's vitamin C or, you know, anything that you take, it will be, you know, you take too much vitamin C and get diarrhea. So even though these are good things, they can have downsides. Okay. Now uh, that 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 uh, exercise issue with metformin is, is is tends to be a recurring topic uh, that we, that we get. Probably find a similar issue with 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 rapamycin and maybe other geriatrics. Like like you said, I mean, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There might be some trade offs, and it seems like one of the trade offs with metformin and probably even rapamycin is the ability to kind of bulk up your muscles. Um, and uh, I think that's just you know just kind of the mechanism of action of metformin and, and potentially rapamycin. You know, because it has that effect on AMP kinase, it has that effect on mTOR, and those are kind of required to bulk up on on muscle. Um, then that, that that's potentially a trade off. So, so what I tell patients is, you know, if you're, you know, working out, you know, for a you know Mr. Universe or something like that, uh, you know, trying to trying to bulk up for something, you know, a competition, you know, to look good, you know, for the beach or something like that. I usually tell people just to skip metformin during that time, or or potentially rapamycin. Um, so, so that's something that comes up. Now, if you look at the studies, the, the, uh, the strength seems to be, even though you don't bulk up as much, you still seem to have the uh, same amount of strength. Uh, so it's not a, it's not a complete, you know, uh, you know, it's not like it, it makes the muscle weaker. Uh, it just doesn't, doesn't provide that, that physical bulking. Uh, so, so Dr. Davis and Claire calls it a, 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 a or is it near bars? Like we talked about like a vanity thing is like, well, you know, you know, if, if vanity is important for you, you know, looking bulky is important, then don't take metformin. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, let's move on. Let's let's talk a little bit about supplements. Um, you know, we, we talked a lot about, you know, metformin, rapamycin, some others. Uh, what are some of your favorite supplements and why? Well, I think that 
you know, there are a few nutritional supplements that everybody should take. <clears throat> Number one is a multiple vitamin mineral. And the reason I think that is, you know, maybe our grandparents didn't need to do that because food was grown locally and it was largely grown organically with uh, manure and compost and stuff. Nowadays, they use a lot of agro-farming with artificial pesticides and uh, fertilizers and things like that. It's harvested prematurely when it hasn't really come to its full nutritional value. Uh, there are a lot of reasons that food today isn't as nutritious as food before, which is to say it doesn't have the same vitamin and mineral content. So for that reason, I think, you know, people say, well, if I eat a healthy diet, do I really need to take a multiple vitamin mineral? I think that you do, unless you're able to eat all organic and you can source, you know, whatever it is that you're getting. But for most of us, that's difficult to do. And a multiple vitamin is an inexpensive way to do that. What do vitamins and minerals do? Every enzyme in the body, all of the chemical processes that occur in the body are done by enzymes. And enzymes, when they're made in the body, they come as pre-enzymes ready to work. And they need two keys, like the safety deposit box that you go to. You need the key that you have and a key that the banker has, and you use them together and it unlocks the box. It's the same way for these enzymes. You need a vitamin and a mineral, whether it's vitamin B2 or vitamin B6 or vitamin C as your vitamin, and whether it's magnesium or cobalt as your mineral, and then the two of those things will unlock the enzyme. So by taking a multiple vitamin every day, you make sure that your enzymes are at optimal purpose. That's one. Number two, vitamin D. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, and it's easy to measure. The, the water-soluble vitamins like vitamin C and the B vitamins, because they're water-soluble, their, their levels go up and down all the time. Whereas the fat-soluble vitamins are more consistent. So um, we measure vitamin D levels. And honestly, most people, and most people means like 90% of the people that I see, they have suboptimal levels of vitamin D. Even with the, the, the range that's given by uh, conventional medicine is 30 to 100. That's the units that they use for vitamin D. And there are a lot of people that are below 30. But then there are a lot of people that are 30, 35, 40, which once again, like testosterone, it's normal, but it's suboptimal. I, by the way, regard optimal as 70 to 80. And many <clears> doctors have somewhat different fields, but a lot of people in the anti-aging field believe that 70, 80 is a real good number to shoot for. So taking some extra vitamin D. How do we get vitamin D? It's not really available in the diet. You get it when sunlight, ultraviolet light hits your skin, and then it converts cholesterol into vitamin D for you. Well, the problem is people don't want to get skin cancer. So we use sunscreen and we use sunscreen that blocks those ultraviolet rays and you don't form your own vitamin D. So for many of us, we need to take supplemental vitamin D and then get your blood checked to make sure that you get your level up into 70 to 80. I think that's a really good one. I think that some type of either fish or flax oil you know, you have omega-3 fats and you have omega-6 fats. Omega-6 fats are like the things that are in vegetable oils, like canola oil and avocado oil, things like that. Omega And they tend to be inflammatory, by the way. Omega-3s tend to be anti-inflammatory. And most of us have an adverse ratio. We have more of the inflammatory than the anti-inflammatory fats in our body. So by taking either fats, flax or fish oil, we increase the anti-inflammatory fats in our, in our body. And then I would say the fourth supplement that I really like is coenzyme Q10. CoQ10 is a cofactor in, uh, in, in energy production. It helps the body make more ATP, more energy. So I like that one. I could go on and on about NAD and many other supplements, but those four that I mentioned, they're simple, they're cheap, they're safe. Uh, and I think that most people uh, are, will find that their, their health improves by taking them.
Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm chuckling to myself a little bit because I'm like, oh, those are boring, Dr. Grossman. People want to hear about like AKG and resveratrol and spermidine. I'm just joking. By the way, I mean, that kind of goes back to the whole thing about diet exercise. Yes, sometimes it's boring to talk about diet and exercise. But yeah, you, 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 have, you have to master the fundamentals first before you start adding the more exotic, you know, I would call them like exotic supplements like AKG and resveratrol and, and uh, terastilbene and, you know, and, and, uh, and spermidine. Of those more kind of like more kind of geotherapeutic like supplement, do you have any favorites among among those? Yeah, no, you've named them. I mean, <laughs> okay, you, you've named that list. <laughs> All uh, right, <laughs> resveratrol, which is the red wine extract, is uh, a lot of what David Sinclair has done his research on. NAD plus, which I think is probably the most popular supplement in the country right now, uh, is also one that David Sinclair has done a lot of research on. It produces energy, helps the body produce more energy. Uh, it improves so many different things. I mean, yeah, though, I mean, there are several in that ilk that are very good for people to take as well. Great. Okay. Let's see. There's a question about cycling. Um, you know, when, when taking gerotherapeutics, such as metformin or apomycin, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, doing so intermittently or cycling them? Or, or do you, I mean, do you have a particular regimen that you found more um, uh, beneficial than others? I don't have hard and fast rules, mm -hmm. but I do like the idea of stopping things periodically. So every once in a while, I take a day off from my supplements. I just don't mm -hmm. take any of them, you know? Yeah, that's uh, Sunday for me. I just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just right. get sick of taking supplements. I'm like, you know what? Sunday's my day off. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it's, you know, that you just get yeah. sick of taking them or, yeah. you know, you just want to give your body a chance you know, to do its own thing, I think that that's okay. I actually think it's a good thing to do. And uh, the same thing applies to testosterone. Mm -hmm. We have people on testosterone, you know, maybe every six months, take a, take a two weeks off, things like that. So, you know, I think that with most of these things, whether it's metformin or rapamycin or whatever, yeah, give your body a break periodically just to kind of reset the clock. <clears throat> now, do I have any hard and fast scientific evidence that this is a good thing? I know, I don't. It's just what I do. So I don't know the answer to that question. It's just what I've always done for the past 45 years. So it, I don't know, uh, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, someone had asked previously about, and you mentioned acarbos, and I think that's a very interesting medicine to talk about. Um, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I was gonna, actually, that was, that was one, of the, one of the questions on here uh, that we we're probably going to segue to. Uh, so can you briefly describe what acarbos is? It's an you know oldie, but kind of coming back in fashion here. Um, you know, and then what's your opinion on, you know, intermittent use of acarbos versus, you know, using it with every meal? Well, uh, just like the other drugs we talked about, metformin for diabetes and rapamycin for anti-rejection, acarbos is another diabetes drug. And the way that it works is it's a starch blocker. So starch is a collection of sugar or glucose molecules, uh, atoms, just glucose, 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 these big bushes and trees in them. And we have uh, enzymes in our body that slice it up and they free the glucose. Well, when you eat starch, say a, a white potato or a piece of bread or some pasta, it's very easy for the body to slice those glucose molecules off and you get a rush of glucose into your bloodstream, your blood sugar goes up, your insulin goes up. Well, those aren't necessarily the most healthful things to have happen. A carbos is blocks that from happening. So now that we have these CGMs, continuous glucose monitors, people can wear them and find out, you know, if I have a piece of bread, I'm at an Italian restaurant, they have some wonderful bread, I have some, I eat it. Oh my goodness my blood sugar shoots up. If I dip that bread in olive oil, the oil is gonna slow down the release, the digestion of the bread, my blood sugar doesn't go up as much. Have a plate of pasta, my blood sugar goes up like crazy. Well, put some olive oil on it, but also consider taking some acarbos with these high starch meals. So uh, what we do then is we re reduce the speed with which the sugar is released in the bloodstream, what's called the glycemic index, so should we do it continuously and intermittently? Obviously, from my point of view, we should do it intermittently. It doesn't have any value to take if you're having 
a meal that has no starch or carbs in it. You know, so if you have a salad for lunch, which really doesn't have any carbs to speak of, I mean, there are a few, but not enough that you want to block their digestion, then I would say don't bother. But, you know, if you have protein and uh, vegetables, probably not going to be an issue for you. But if you have, you know, some of these high starch foods, whether it's corn or cereals or rice uh, or bread or pasta, then I would think that a carbose is a good idea to take. And you'll get more information for one person. One food might make their sugar go up for another person, something else. That's where the continuous glucose monitors are so valuable to give individuals the data they need about their personal metabolism. Great, great. All right. Um, I think that's about all the time we have right now. Um, there was a couple more questions about emerging research, about hallmarks of aging, about LDN. I think we'll probably have to keep those for another for another call. Uh, you, you know, this is just our first one, so hopefully we'll have many more. Uh, any closing thoughts? Any other like anything else? Uh, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk about. You think people should know about? Um, or, uh, you know, or any any uh, parting words on this Friday afternoon? <laughs> well, uh, you know, when we began, I talked about stress and sleep being such an issue when we didn't really mention it ever since then. And I think that we should each kind of take away how important it is that we get our stress levels under control by whatever mechanism we can. And with that thought in mind, I want to wish everyone a really relaxing and fun filled weekend. Well, all right. Thank you very, very much, everybody, for joining us. And uh, and have it's well. At least here in Michigan, it's nice weather. I hope everybody else uh, enjoys their weekend.